anybody who's done any one of a whole host of practices that bring you to greater awareness, cultivated awareness about the breath, um, understands how to be with someone as their body begins to shrink and dry up and you don't see very well and you don't hear very well and you don't smell or taste and you begin to kind of fade or withdraw from the ordinary world. That whole process that is the dying process is such that um, towards the end of life what you're left with is mostly breath. What was so interesting to me was how, how little interest he had in trying to find the best doctor or do anything um, heroic to try to find out what his diagnosis was or live longer. A wonderful man named uh, Mickey Stunkert who was on the faculty uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. He came to see Suzuki Roshi that summer after he came back from Tassajara and was, among other things, quite jaundiced and complained about uh, being very itchy. And Mickey Stunkard immediately guessed that Suzuki Roshi had uh, metastasized gallbladder cancer. He actually suggested to Suzuki Roshi that he could take him to one of the really great experts at Stanford and have some, a second opinion and maybe help his, get his uh, a, a diagnosis a little bit more quickly. And, and Suzuki Roshi said, no, I'll just stay with my doctor here. The day the doctors told him that he had c cancer, um, I came into the room where he was staying right after the doctors had been with him, and he patted the bed next to me and said, here, come, sit down. He was sitting on the edge of the bed with his legs dangling in his little, you know, hospital gown. The nurse had just brought his lunch in on a tray. And in the preceding weeks, um, Mrs. Suzuki and I had been quarantining his utensils and his food because the doctor had said it looks like he has hepatitis and you have to be very careful to not use his utensils and eat, keep the food separate. And so we'd done all that. And, so this particular uh, lunchtime, Suzuki Roshi motioned to me to come over, sit on the bed next to him. And as I walked towards him, he mouthed the words, I have cancer. I have cancer. With a kind of grin on his face. And I sat down next to him, and he leaned over, and he took a fork full of food from his lunch plate and fed it to me and said, now we can eat together again. I remember uh, some days when he began to be more quiet and didn't, didn't talk a whole lot. Um, I can remember sitting next to his bed and every once in a while this little skinny arm would come out from under the covers and you know, he'd kind of stick it out in the air like this and then I'd massage his arm and then he'd slowly put it back under the covers and then you know, five or 10 or 20 minutes later, another arm would come out from under the covers and you know then I'd massage that arm and they'd disappear back under the covers and then you know an hour later a leg would come out from under the covers and, or he'd indicate that maybe I could help him sit up and rub his back but um, not so much out of pain or as a, a way of distracting but just he was giving me something to do to help, help him be comfortable by the time he died, when I looked back on those months, I, I kind of would shake myself and think, you know, at no point did I feel like anything extraordinary was going on, and yet the cumulative effect of being with him in those months was that I'd been in a circumstance and with a person who was quite extraordinary. That caught my attention, you know, that, that juxtaposition of ordinary and extraordinary. That was my idea of how it's supposed to be done, or at least how it can be done. And what I marvel at is that I've actually been able to 
sit with a number of people in exactly the same way. There's a, a quality of intimate connectedness when you sit with someone while they're dying that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with knowing their life story or even knowing their name. There's a way you can know someone with the kind of intimacy that I always thought was restricted to a lover or to one's child. And um, I'm very grateful for having uh, learned about that capacity for meeting that we all have. And Suzuki Roshi is really the first person who demonstrated that to me and allowed me to have that kind of experience with him. I think without question, uh, my experience taking care of Suzuki Roshi as he was in the last months of his life and having the experience of being with him during that time and seeing that he came to his own dying, his own sickness, his own passing away before he was really ready to go or before he'd done the work he wanted to do, um, seeing how he died and, and experiencing the consequences of his capacity, very developed capacity to be quite radically present day by day in a very ordinary way, but the cumulative effect of those months was very powerful. And, you know, it's not really that I went out looking for dying people to take care of. But I think largely because some people knew that I had sat with and taken care of Suzuki Roshi during that time in his life and taken care of him right at the end of his life and took care of his body and all of that, people within a year started asking me to do that for them. Partially, because of whatever feelings they had for Suzuki Roshi, but I think also because there was some sense that I wasn't afraid of the dying process, which I wasn't. And I think uh, the experience I had with Suzuki Roshi was really the significant teaching for me about what is possible in the way we die and the relationship between uh, the way we live and the way we die. And in no small measure, uh, some direct experience with how to meet the various issues that come up in the dying process around pain, around giving up your dreams about what you're going to do before you die, around um, control or not being able to control things, uh, all of that. Those are all you know, issues that come up in virtually everybody's life when they start to die. Mm -hmm. So having once seen what was possible, I had a lot of energy and enthusiasm for keeping people company uh, out of some sense that that in some cases would make it more possible for someone to stay with themselves. But there's something about it keeping someone company rather than having them be alone. Um, I also understood after Suzuki Roshi's passing that practicing a breath-oriented meditation practice was very good training for the dying process and that as a meditation practitioner I actually had something to offer to someone who was dying in terms of some not so much intellectual understanding, but more experiential sense about the breath 
and the effect of different kinds of breath, different characteristics of breath on state of mind. All of that becomes quite central in the dying process. Well, I'm not talking so much about any particular exercise as I am um, the recognition that begins to come from practicing a breath-oriented meditation, where you're attending to the breath, where you're beginning to study the different characteristics of the breath, where you begin to understand, oh, when the breath is high up in the body and shallow and rapid, uh, there are certain qualities of mind that are more likely to be present. Agitation or upset or fear or whatever. And that there are other qualities of breath that have to do with uh, longer inhalation and exhalation, slower, uh, deeper down in the body that seem to accompany different physical and mental states for, for example, more calmness. And um, anybody who's done any one of a whole host of practices that bring you to greater awareness, cultivated awareness about the breath, um, understands how to be with someone as their body begins to shrink and dry up and you don't see very well and you don't hear very well and you don't smell or taste and you begin to kind of fade or withdraw from the ordinary world. That whole process that is the dying process is such that um, towards the end of life what you're left with is mostly breath. The body begins to be much more faint and slight and um, in the end what what you come to is breath and knowing how to stay present with my own breath enhances my capacity to stay present with someone else's. Uh, I also uh, very quickly learned that if I breathe with another person, if I let them be the leader and I follow their breath and I make a sound of ah on their exhalation, that slight subtle emphasis on the exhalation leads the person to having their breathing go slower and deeper and to come to a certain kind of calmness. So without really doing much, I can keep the person company without requiring that they talk or answer questions or get too involved w with me. At the same time, there's a sense of connection that's not intrusive, but it's also a sense of accompaniment that um, supports the person going to a slower, deeper exhalation, which is completely conducive to easing the process of passing over. Just no question about it. And after I sat with a few people, I, I learned each, with each person I learned something more uh, in the way of refined, refining my sense of how to stay out of someone's way but still keep them company. And I very quickly realized what a gift it is to die with company that's not intrusive. A company where you're not, you as the dying person aren't being asked to do anything, to take care of the person who's keeping you company. Uh, a few years after Suzuki Roshi died, I met a psychologist uh, who lived in New York at the time who had uh, done a study of the four major hospitals in New York and um, from her study discovered that a very high number of people were dying in those hospitals alone. That at that moment of death, suddenly all the doctors and nurses and aides would be somewhere else. And she then, on the basis of that study, began uh, asking questions of the medical staff in these different hospitals. And what she uncovered was an enormous amount of fear and discomfort on the part of the medical people in the hospitals, and a certain readiness to leave the room if it seemed like the person was, going to, was about to die. Well, when I heard her description of her study, uh, that was a kind of, uh, I felt some encouragement to be available to the degree that I could be if 
people ask me to keep them company, uh, out of some sense about um, what a kindness that is. And it seemed like a situation in which I, as a Zen practitioner, had something to offer, but also it was very clear to me that I learned from the people I sat with. I always learned something about the breath. I learned something about the kinds of things that become obstacles or that can be eased in, in the dying process. And a lot of that really arose for me from being with Suzuki Roshi and seeing how he did those last months of his life and how much what he, the way he was and what he did during those months was not in any way different from the way he'd been in the previous years. That he was absolutely, completely consistent. And he was actually demonstrating the consequences of being radically present moment by moment. And the kind of uh, liberation and real joy in that, even in the process of dying. So by the time he died, when I looked back on those months, I, I kind of would shake myself and think, you know, at no point did I feel like anything extraordinary was going on, and yet the cumulative effect of being with him in those months was that I'd been in a circumstance and with a person who was quite extraordinary. So that was, that caught my attention, you know, that, that juxtaposition of ordinary and extraordinary. This is, of course, something I didn't know until some long time after he died, but the previous um, March he had gotten sick when he was teaching up in Portland, Oregon, and had, had to come home and went into the hospital and was operated on uh, in an emergency operation for gallbladder. And as a routine uh, after the surgery, they did some biopsies on the gallbladder, and it was only then that they discovered that the gallbladder had cancer cells in it. But the surgeon was quite confident that the cancer had not metastasized. The tissue around the gallbladder looked healthy. and So Suzuki Roshi and his wife didn't say anything to anybody. It was just a gallbladder operation. Um, it later was clear that what happened when he got sick at the end of that summer of 1971 was that the gallbladder cancer had indeed metastasized. Um, what was so interesting to me was how how little interest he had in trying to find the best doctor or do anything um, heroic to try to find out what his diagnosis was, or live longer. Um, a wonderful man named uh, Mickey Stunkard, who was on the faculty uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, the medical school, I was a, one of the early Zen practitioners in the United States, and would come out to practice with Suzuki Roshi whenever he could. and. Uh, would often be coming out here to do things at the medical school at Stanford. And he came to see Suzuki Roshi that summer after he came back from Tassajara and was, among other things, quite jaundiced and complained about uh, being very itchy. And Mickey Stunkard immediately uh, guessed that Suzuki Roshi had uh, metastasized gallbladder cancer because this is one of the symptoms. And he actually suggested to Suzuki Roshi that he could take him to one of the really great experts at Stanford and have some a second opinion and maybe help his get his a, a, a diagnosis a little bit more quickly and and Suzuki Roshi said no I'll just stay with my doctor here well the doctor he had at the time was young and we all realized later not so experienced took him a long time to realize that Suzuki Roshi didn't have hepatitis. Um, and in fact, the day he um, was told, he went back into the hospital finally for some additional testing, and the day the doctors told him that he had c cancer, um, I came into the room where he was staying right after the doctors had been with him, and he patted the bed next to me and said, here, come, sit down. 
he was sitting on the edge of the bed with his legs dangling in his little you know, hospital gown. The nurse had just brought his lunch in on a tray. And in the preceding weeks, um, Mrs. Suzuki and I had been quarantining his utensils and his food because the doctor had said it looks like he has hepatitis and you have to be very careful to not use his utensils and eat, keep the food separate. And so we'd done all that. And so this particular uh, lunchtime, Suzuki Roshi motioned to me to come over, sit on the bed next to him. And as I walked towards him, he mouthed the words, I have cancer. I have cancer. With a kind of grin on his face. And I sat down next to him, and he leaned over, and he took a fork full of food from his lunch plate and fed it to me and said, now we can eat together again. Because, you know, in the course of having meals together, sometimes we'd say, oh, this is delicious. Would you like some of this? And we'd swap food back and forth. And in that moment, you know, my heart sank. And yet what I was seeing in front of me was someone who was celebrating what he could celebrate, which was we don't have to go through all of this fuss and bother about contamination, etc. You can't catch what I have. We can eat together in this cozy and familiar way with this big grin. I think um, when he finally realized that he was in fact not going to live as long as he had hoped he might from the standpoint of taking care of some things with regard to his students that he really wanted to do, that he did have some sense of regret that he didn't have a little more time. But it was really only around trying to take care of everything at the center before he died. And apart from that, I never, in those last months of his life, I never saw him um, be resistant to the fact that he was dying or try to get away from it or resentful, N nothing like that. He was just completely present with whatever the day brought, whatever was the situation. I do remember at one point um, his doctor um, was convinced he must be in a great deal of pain because gallbladder cancer is supposed to be one of the more painful cancers. And he brought Suzuki Roshi some pain medicine, which he was pretty insistent Suzuki Roshi should take. And Suzuki Roshi didn't say much, but he kept the pills by his bed. And at a certain point, Suzuki Roshi said that, uh, you know, would I get him a glass of water? And he thought he would take the pain medication because his doctor would feel better if he did. So he took this pill. And about uh, four hours later, he handed me the bottle of pills and he said, you have to get rid of them. I don't want to take those again. I don't like what happened to my state of mind. But his initial um, notion was, this is something my doctor really wants me to do, and because he wants me to do it, I'll do it for his sake. And I actually didn't ever have the sense that he was in pain that was disquieting. Uh, he had a uh, clearly very developed sense of how to be with himself and his body and whatever sensations he was having. And he certainly enjoyed being taken care of. Uh, particularly a, as he got to the point where he was entirely in bed, um, he loved having his arms or his back rubbed or some, you know, a glass of orange juice. Or I mean, he really enjoyed being attended to in those ways, but not so much out of discomfort as much as this was what we were doing together and there were certain things that seemed to help him be more comfortable. I remember uh, some days when he began to be more quiet and didn't, didn't talk a whole lot. Um, I can remember sitting next to his bed and every once in a while this little skinny arm would come out from under the covers and 
you know, he'd kind of stick it out in the air like this, and then I'd massage his arm, and then he'd slowly put it back under the covers, and then, you know, five or ten or twenty minutes later, another arm would come out from under the covers, and, you know, then I'd massage that arm, and, and it'd disappear back under the covers, and then, you know, an hour later, a leg would come out from under the covers, and, or he'd indicate that maybe I could help him sit up and rub his back. But um, not so much out of pain or as a, a way of distracting, but just he was giving me something to do to help, help him be comfortable. So there was that, that quality of being present with and accepting and being interested in not resisting and not fighting um, his, his sickness. Just before he died, he got up and took a bath which I always thought was a sublimely Japanese thing to do, since the Japanese emphasize cleanliness so much. So he got up and he took a bath, and um, he uh, asked uh, for Dick Baker to come into the room, somehow indicated to Mrs. Suzuki that he wanted to see uh, Richard Baker, and. Uh, Dick asked him, when, when will we, something like, when will we meet again? And Suzuki Roshi drew this big circle, which is the way of symbolically drawing the mark of emptiness in the realm of the absolute. And um, he died just as the bell was ringing for opening, just at the end of the ringing of the bells for the opening period of meditation for the um, December retreat on Dece the morning of December 4th. And we all had a sense that he was ready and had just been waiting for the right moment, and that was the right moment. So he died very quietly, very calmly. And we then moved his body from, after leaving it for a while, then moved it uh, to uh, the room where he had met with his students in private interviews, made a, a mat and dressed him in his robes and laid him out, and then everybody came to pay their last respects, which took many, many, many hours. People came for most of the day. And then... Um, we had his body taken to a uh, mortuary, largely at the request of the members of the Japanese congregation where he had been their, their priest for a long time. And um, his son, Hoichi, who is now the abbot and priest at Rinsoen in uh, Japan, uh, flew over and he and Dick and I um, dressed his body after it was embalmed uh, in his robes and had an open coffin and people were able to come and sit with him and pay their respects for about a week. And um, we had, there was somebody, usually several of us, sitting with him continuously day and night during that week. And then uh, at the end of the week um, we all went to the crematorium it was very interesting because at the crematorium there was a kind of stage with a very beautiful sliding uh, glass, a door made of uh, stained glass, but the door slid and the coffin was on the stage in front of that kind of screen and we did a final ceremony before his body was cremated. And the people who ran the crematorium, of course, were used to everybody leaves at the end of the ceremony and we all sat there. You know, I don't know, 60 people or so, a large number of us. And um, we, we, we weren't going anywhere. We were staying for the cremation. So then they opened the doors, and then behind that is where the cremation ovens were. And we all got back there and stood around and helped put the coffin into the oven. And Mrs. Suzuki pushed the button that started the fire. And we all chanted while his body was being burned. And... I think for the people at the crematorium, they just they didn't know what to make of it. 
but you know there was a kind of this sense of a kind of thoroughness of having taken care of him until he died and sat with his body for this extended period of time and this was a way to complete that whole process and then sometime later we had a, a ceremony for placing some of his ashes in the ashes site down at Tassajara and some of the ashes went to uh, his temple in Japan so but it seemed that whole process seemed like a fairly unbroken continuum so that was my idea of how it's supposed to be done or at least how it can be done and what I marvel at is that I've actually been able to sit with a number of people in exactly the same way for some period of anywhere from hours to months until they die and sit with their body and take the body to be cremated and then do whatever is appropriate for the taking care of the ashes. Every single person I've sat with as they died has taught me something I didn't know about the breath, about the characteristics of breath, about the relationship between a particular breath with a particular characteristic and its effect on the body and on states of mind. I've also learned an enormous amount about what creates an obstacle for someone as they pass over, either in their own mind stream or uh, on the part of the people around them. I've seen um, people actually hold someone back because they weren't ready for that person to die. I've just learned, I mean, in every case, I've just learned more about the process of living and, the, and dying and the kind of intimate uh, connection. I mean, they're not separate. And um, a kind of deepening, I think, in terms of my own spiritual life. Um, there's a, a quality of intimate connectedness when you sit with someone while they're dying that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with knowing their life story or even knowing their name. There's a way you can know someone with a kind of intimacy that I always thought was restricted to a lover or to one's child. And um, I'm very grateful for having uh, learned about that capacity for meeting that we all have. And Suzuki Roshi is really the first person who demonstrated that to me and allowed me to have that kind of experience with him. And it really uh, effect, has affected my life ever since then. I mean, I would say of all the teachings that I've had and some really remarkable teachers, the teachings I had from him, and in particular from being with him in those last months, were the most profound and went the most deep and resonate in me as though it was just yesterday. I still, you know, some insight or some recognition will come up now from then, and that was, what, 20, 71, it's now 98 long time ago. And the vividness of that quality of his being present, um, I haven't been able to ignore that experience of his quality of presence. It gave me, he gave me, by his example, some taste of what's possible. Having tasted that, it's hard to forget, hard to turn away from it. He undoubtedly uh, had different ways of doing that with different people, but um, my memory is that he was very encouraging that we, we, had, we had the Dharma, we had practice, and that uh, we were all right. You know, in some ways, not all that different from the description of how the Buddha was with his own disciples when he was close to dying. 
And I think he had a very keen sense of wanting us to take care of each other and take care of our practice together. And he really, I think, understood that um, the Zen Center had come to be uh, a vehicle for carrying teachings. And that was partially his something unique in him as a teacher. But it was also um, out of his recognition of Richard Baker's remarkable ability to um, build an institution that would carry his teachings. He had, um, he had some big uh, aims um, that were not out of any kind of inflated sense of himself, but um, he took very seriously that his students in America were serious and would keep practicing. And I think that confidence on his part was part of what he could uh, express to those of us who have continued since he died. Initially, for many people, uh, there was an enormous amount of grief with his passing. Interestingly, I think that the uh, people who were the closest to him, those of us who practiced with him closely and had a lot of contact with him, didn't feel suddenly a loss. The form body was gone, but there was a way in which he continued so palpably to be present. I certainly felt that. I felt like uh, there wasn't, in a certain way, that big a change because there was so much of his teaching and his example that was still in my life and in my experience with him. I think for people who had a more uh, distant or intermittent relationship or didn't know him very well, it was like a series of concentric circles. And people who were farther away from him, I think, felt his loss in a, in a different way. Um, I think that the whole process of trying to figure out how to continue the life of the center and the turning to the task of buying and developing uh, the center at Green Gulch Farm was a way of channeling positive energy as a kind of antidote to the grief and the potential for sinking after he died. So the Zen Center actually bought uh, Green Gulch the following April and, and there was, so there was that positive focal point and a lot of energy went in, in, uh, in the direction of building the center, finding a, a way to extend the institution as a vehicle for his teaching and to continue practicing. And you know, he had a, an enormous effect on people who um, maybe had only met him once. And of course, eventually, uh, enormous impact on many people through his book. I have a friend in New York, a woman who's now in her uh, later 80s, who met him when she was 60, and uh, talked to me just recently about what a striking uh, experience it was for her to see him and be with him, and to really understand, oh, this is what Buddhist practice cultivates, and a kind of inspiration to pick up uh, practice, which she went, went for, really, as a result of meeting him. And she's now in her late 80s, continued all these years, uh, a very uh, strong practice that's really the center of her life, and has uh, helped her enormously and led to her great kindness, especially in her very large extended family. And there are hundreds, probably thousands of stories like that. People who met him once or twice and, and saw something in him and the way he would stand or the way he would meet you, the sense of, be of, the sense of being with someone who is absolutely and completely present. You taste that once and um, 
hard to forget. I still hear his voice often. Um, I still continue to remember teachings. I remember um, particularly um, a few conversations that we had after driving back from Tassajara when we would arrive sometimes late at night. And I remember one Thanksgiving in particular when uh, the center was still on Bush Street. One uh, Thanksgiving, we got back about uh, nine or so, and we sat in the car in front of the temple for another three hours, talking about uh, issues of trust. And a lot of what he said that night, I think I didn't understand. And uh, some of the fragments of that conversation bubble up. So I continue and have, all these years, continue to have some fragment bubble up, almost as though it can bubble up when I'm ready to understand it or take it on in a certain way. So I, I continue to feel his presence as a teacher quite strongly. One of the, a number of images, but one in particular is the image of him uh, at morning tea one morning um, playing with some glasses that had belonged to my grandmother that had a hinge in the uh, nose piece and in the middle of the ear pieces so the whole thing could fold up to the size of one lens and then you'd punch a little button and the glasses would come open and they had a little stick on the side. You'd hold them up to your eyes, you know, to read the program notes at, the, at a concert or something like that. And I had found these glasses and taken them with me to morning tea and he was quite delighted with them. He kept popping the button and looking out through them and then he'd fold them all back together and then he'd pop the button. And I have a picture of him uh, at the point of popping the button and peering through the glasses with this look of uh, playfulness that uh, that particular um, image of him uh, arises for me rather often. Um, and I have a few things that uh, he gave me or that uh, belonged to him at one time that I uh, keep in the corner of my eye as reminders of him, like the, the yucca brush, the yucca branch that he made into a sumi brush to draw a Zen mind, beginner's mind calligraphy that's on the cover of his book. I look at that often because um, it says a lot about how he lived and how he did things. And it's also very beautiful. So the images aren't always of him as much as they might be of things he loved or things he used or things he made. I have a rosary that is made of beads that belong to him, which I sometimes use. And uh, I like working the beads, knowing that his fingers worked them sometime in the past. But mostly he's present for me in my heart more than anything else. He was extraordinarily kind. He had the ability to um, make you feel very special at the same time that you knew that everybody else in the room felt the same way. There wasn't a limited supply of that uh, quality of uh, feeling appreciated or seen. It was a real, a real gift that he had to, to be with all of us in that way. He was also, um, he was also sometimes uh, very uh, practical. I remember one time after the Zen Center had moved to the Page Street building, and um, the street life uh, around the building was at that point uh, very problematic. There was a lot of drug dealing and a lot of uh, mugging and street violence. and So there was a lot of attention about who came in and the front door and some wariness about some of the neighbors who were, uh, in some cases, given to unsavory ways. And I remember one day this young 
a young man came, somehow got in the front door and we were all kind of nervous about him. We didn't quite know how to get him out. He was boisterous and angry and I think we were all afraid he was going to pull a knife or something. And in the middle of, you know, trying to figure out how to talk him into leaving, Suzuki Roshi showed up and, you know, kind of got right in between this young man and the rest of us and just started talking to him and engaging him in conversation and asking him questions. And we all kind of backed away and gave him lots of room. And Suzuki Roshi kept talking to him and they, you know, back and forth. And then they started walking over towards the door and back and forth. And then Suzuki Roshi opened the door as if almost to go out and stand in the sun out in the front porch. And the young man went out and then Suzuki Roshi said, well, goodbye. And then he shut the door. <laughs> great. We all, you know, heaved a sigh of relief and I think we're a little embarrassed because he just shown us something about uh, skillful means. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah.